Section 13. The Job of the Amcal of Between the Lines by Boyd Cable. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The wide door of the barn creaked open and emitted a swirl of sleety snow, a gust of bitter cold wind, and the bombardier. A little group of men round a guttering candle lamp looked up. Hello, Father Christmas, said the centre driver. You're a bit late for your proper day, but we'll let you off if you fill our stockings up proper. Wipe your feet careful on the mat, said the lead driver, and put your umbrella in the old stand. Yeah, don't go shaking that snow all over the straw, said the wheel driver indignantly. I'm going to sleep there presently, and the straw is damp enough as it is. Glad you're so sure about sleeping there, the bombardier said, divesting himself of his bandolier and struggling out of his snow-covered coat. By the look of things, it's quite on the cards. You get turned out presently and have to take up some pills to the guns. Pretty busy tonight, ain't they? said the centre driver. We heard em bumping away, good-o. You don't hear the off of it back here, said the bombardier. Wind's blowing most of the row away. They're going it hot and strong. Now where's my mess tin got to? Haven't had no tea yet and it's near eight o'clock. <laughs> I'm just about froze through, too. Here you are, said the centre driver, throwing a mess tin over. And the cook kept tea hot for you and the rest that was out. Pull that door shut behind you, said the wheel driver. His barn's cold as an ice house already, and the roof leaks like a broke sieve. Billy, strew it ain't half a billy. The bombardier returned presently with a mess tin of raw, milkless and sugarless tea, and proceeded to make a meal off that, some stone-hard biscuits, and the scrapings of a pot of jam. "'What sort of trip did you have?' asked the centre driver. "'Any ways peaceful, or was you dodging the coal boxes this time?' "'Not a coal box or any other box,' said the bombardier, hammering a biscuit to fragments with a rifle butt. "'And I haven't had a shell drop near me for a week.' "'If we keeps on like this,' said the centre driver. We'll get fancy and we're back on Long Valley manoeuvres. Who are you grousing about anyway? remarked the wheel driver. This is a ammunition column, ain't it? Or do you suppose it's an amcal's business to go chasing after bombardments and shell fire? <laughs> if you ain't satisfied, you'd better try and get transferred to the trenches. Or if that's too peaceful for you, put in the lead driver, you might apply to be sent to England, where the war's raging and the Zeppelins is killing women and window panes. Talking of transferring to the trenches, said the bombardier, putting down his empty mess tin and producing his pipe, reminds me of a lieutenant we had join us a month or two back. There was a time you chaps was away attached to that other division, so you didn't know him. He'd been with a battery right through, but he got a leave, and when he come back from England, he was sent to us. His batman told me he was a bit upset at first about being cut adrift from his pals in the battery, but he perked up and reckoned he was going to have things nice and cushy for a bit, and he as much as says so himself to me the first time he was taking ammunition up and I was along with him. I'd been doing orderly at the battery and brought down the requisition for so many rounds, and it being the lieutenant's first turp up and not knowing the road, uh, he has me up in front with him to show the way. It was an unusual fine morning, I remember, having stopped raining for almost an hour, and just as we started something that might have been a sun tried to its hardest to shine. Soon as we was on the road, the lieutenant gives the word to march at ease and lights up a cigarette himself. Great morning, ain't it, bombardier, he says. Not more than a foot or two of mud on the roads and the temperature almost above freezing point. <laughs> I'm just about beginning to like this job on the Amcal. Have you been with a battery out here? <laughs> I told him yes, and came to the column after being slightly wounded. Well, he says, you knows how much better off you are here. You don't have no standing to the gun after night in the rain and live all the rest of the nights and all the days in a dirty, muddy, stuffy punk hole. <laughs> That's the one thing I'm most glad of to be out of, he says. 
living under the ground like a rabbit in a burrow with every chance of having its head blowed off if he looks up over the edge. I've had enough of dugouts and observing from the trenches and coal box dodging to last me a bit, and it's a pleasant change to be riding a decent horse on a most indecent apology for a road and not a Jack Johnson in sight, even if they are in earring. He made several more remarks like that during the morning, and of course I agreed with him. I mostly does agree with an officer, and most especially a young un. If you don't, he always thinks he's right, and you're just that much big a fool not to know it. And the younger he is, the more right he is, and the bigger fool you or anyone else is. Well, the lieutenant's enthusiasm cools off a bit when it begins to rain again, like as if someone had turned on the tap of a waterfall. But he tried to cheer himself, remarking that most likely his battery was being flooded out of their dugouts. But I could see he was beginning to doubt whether the Amcal's job was as cushy as he'd reckoned when the off-lead of number one wagon tries a cross-channel swim act in one of them four-foot deep ditches. The wagons had to pull aside to let some transport motor lorries pass, and one's off-lead that was a new horse just come to the column from base remounts and had some objections to motor lorries hooting in his ear and scraping past an eighth of an inch from his nose, he aside slipped into the ditch. He stood there with the water up to his shoulder and the lead driver looking down on him and repeating rapid-fire prayers over him. I may say it took the best bit of half an hour to get that blighter onto the road again, and the lieutenant prancing around and saying things a parrot would blush to repeat. But he did more than say things, and I'm willing to admit it. He got down off his horse and did his best to coax the off-lead out with kind words and a riding cane. And when they missed fire and we got a drag rope around the silly brute, the lieutenant laid old and muddied himself up with the rest. We had to dig down the bank a bit at last and hook a team on the drag rope and we pulled that horse out of the mud like pulling a cork from a bottle. It was raining in tons all this time, and I fancy the lieutenant's opinion of the Amcal's job had reined back another pace or two, especially as he'd slipped and come down a full length in the mud when hauling on the drag rope, and had also slid one leg in the ditch well over the boot top in reaching out for a good swipe with the cane. We plods off again at last, and presently we begins to get abreast of some position where one of our big siege guns was belting away. A bit further on, the road took a turn, and the siege gun shells were roaring along over our heads like an express train going through a tunnel, and the lieutenant kept cocking a worried eye round every time she banged, and presently he says sharp-like to the drivers to walk out their teams and get clear of the line of fire. If a German battery starts trying to out that fella, he says to me, we just about stand a healthy chance a meeting an odd shell or two that's trying for the range. We had to pass through a bit of a town called uh, Palu, and uh, just before we comes to it, we met some teams from one of the columns, other sections, coming back. Their officer was in front as we passed. He called to the lieutenant that Palu had been shelled that morning, and the headquarters staff near blotted out. Oh, I could just see the lieutenant chewing this over as we went on, and presently he asked me if it's any ways a frequent thing for us to come under fire taking ammunition up. I told him about a few at the times I'd seen it happen myself, and uh, uh, also about how we had the airmen and the German guns making a dead set at the column during the retreat and shelling us out of one place after the other. Before I finished it, we hears the whoop of a big shell and a crash in the town, and the drivers begin to look round at each other. Bang, bang, another couple of shells drops in poor old Palu, and the drivers begins to look at the lieutenant and uh, to finger their reins. He kept on, of course, and I follows him, and the teams follow us. I oh, see there's a church tower in the town, Bombardier, he says. Does our road run near it? I told him we had to go through the square where the church stood. Then we come pretty near walking through the bull's eye of their target, he says, for I'll bet they're reckoning 
on an observation post being in the tower, and they're trying to out it. We got into Palu, and it was like going through it at midnight, only with daylight instead of lamplight. There wasn't an inhabitant to be seen, except one man peeping up from a cellar grating, and, and one woman running after a toddling kid that had strayed out. She was shrieking quick-fire French at it, and when she grabbed it up and started back, the kid opened his lungs and near yelled the roof off. A woman ran into a house, and the door slammed and shut off the shrieking, like lifting the needle off a gramophone disc. And it left the mine street most awful empty, and still, with a jingle of the team's harness and clatter of the wagon wheels, the only sounds. Another few shells came in, and one hit a house down the street in front of us. We saw the slates and the chimney pots fair jump in the air, and uh, the old house sort of collapsed in a heap in a billowing cloud of white smoke and dust. There were some of our troops hooking a few wounded civilians out as we passed, and the road was cluttered up with bricks and half a door and broken bits of chairs and tables and crockery. Fair blew the inside out of the house, that shell did. When we come clear of the town, there was a long stretch of clear road to cover, and we was plodding down this when we hears the hum of an airplane. The lieutenant squints up and, It's a Torb, he says. Begging your pardon, sir, I told him, but it's a German. No mistaking them bird-shaped wings and tail. He's a German, sure enough. That's why I just said bombardier, he says, which it wasn't, but I knew it was no use saying so. The aeroplane swoops round and comes flying straight at us and passed about our heads and circles round to have a good look at us. A lieutenant was fair riled. Dash his impudence, he says. If he'd only come a bit lower, we might fetch him a smack. And he tells the gunners to get their rifles out. But the German knew too much to come close down, though he flew right over us once or twice. Why in thunder don't some of our guns have a wail at him? The lieutenant says angry like, or our airmen get up and shoot some holes in him. He'll be dropping a clothes basket full of bombs on my wagons presently, like as not, and I can't even loose off a rifle at the bounder. Good Lord, that ever I should live to walk along a road like a time sheep and let a mouldy German chuck parcels of bombs at me without me being able to do more and shake my fist at him. And he swore most vicious. The airplane flew off at last, but even then the lieutenant wasn't satisfied. He'll be back home to report this ammunition column on this particular spot on the road, he says, if he's not taking off the glad tidings on a wireless to his batteries now. And presently, I suppose, he'll start starring this road with high explosive shell. Did ever you know a wagon full to the brim we light eyed? being hit by a high-explosive bombardier or air out would affect the column's health i knew of a german column that one of our airplanes dropped a bomb on at the end sir i says i passed the place on the road myself soon after and what happened he asks and i told him it seemed the bomb exploded the wagon it hit and the wagons exploded each other that ammunition column i says went off like a packet of crackers one wagon after the other, and when we came up, all that was left of that column was a reek of sulphur and a hole in the road. That's cheerful, says the lieutenant, with us loaded down to the gunwale with lidite, and the prospect of being a target for every German gun within range of this road. He fidgeted in his saddle a bit, and then, I suppose, he says, they'll calculate our pace and the distance we've moved since this airman saw us, and they'll shell the section of the road just ahead of us now to glory. I'd halt for a bit just to cheat them, for they'll shoot by the map without seeing us, but that requisition for Lydite was uh, urgent, wasn't it? I told him it was so, and the battery captain had told me to get it in quick to the column. Then we'll just have to push on and chance it, says the lieutenant, though I must own I do hate being made a helpless running deer target to every German gunner that likes to coconut shy at me. Like a packet of crackers. Good Lord. We plodded on, the lieutenant spurring his horse on and reining him back and cocking his ear for the first shell bumping on the road. 
nothing happened for quite a bit after that and i was just about beginning to feel satisfied that the germ bird had run into a streak of air that our anti-aircraft guns kept strictly preserved and that they'd served a trespassers will be spiflicated notice on him and had punctured him in his wings but just as we rounded a curve and came into a long striped piece of the road i hears a high rising swoosh and before it finished and before the bang of the burst reached us spout goes a cloud of black smoke way far down the road this says the lieutenant is going to be highly interesting not to say exciting presently i figure that's either a four point two or a five point nine inch high explosive hun and there's another of the dose from the same bottle and about a hundred yards this way along the road i don't know how their eye explosive will mix with ours but if they get one direct hit on a wagon we'll know all about it pretty quick a brock's crystal palace firework show won't be in it with the ensuing performance and that remark of yours bombardier about a pack of the crackers recurs to my mind with most disquieting persistency and still they come as the poet remarks they was coming too and no fatal error no hurry about em but a most alarming regularity i was all pitching plumb on that road and each one about fifty to a hundred yards nearer our procession and us walking straight into the shower too the swoosh bang of each one kept getting louder and louder and not a single one was missing the road i tell you i could feel the flesh creeping on my bones and a feeling in the pit of my stomach like i'd swallowed a tuppenny ice cream whole there was no way of dodging remember we'd a ditch lippin full of water along both sides of the road and we knew without looking though the lieutenant did have one squint that they was the usual brand of ditch hereabouts anything down to six foot deep and sides cut down as straight as a cellar wall it was no use trotting cause we might just be hurrying up to be in time to arrive on the right spot to meet one and it was no use halting for exactly the same reason the lieutenant reins back beside the leading team and believe me there wasn't one pair of eyes in all that outfit that wasn't glued on him or a pair of ears that wasn't waiting anxious for some order to come and i'm including my own eyes and ears in the catalogue there was nothing to be done and nothing to be said and we all knew it but at the same time we was ready to jump to any order the lieutenant passed out the shells was dropping at about ten to fifteen seconds interval and we could see it was going to be a matter of blind luck whether one pitched short or over or fair on top of us they were closer spiced too as they come nearer and i reckon there wasn't more than fifty or sixty yards between the last two or three bursts and we were still walking on every man with his reins short and feeling his horse's mouth and his knees gripping the saddle hard bang one hits the road about one fifty to two hundred yards short and we heard chips of it whizzing on past us the lieutenant looks round well i say trot ye'll trot he shouts and no man is to stop or slow up to pick up any one hit next second crash comes another about a hundred yards off and before the lumps of it sung past trot yells the lieutenant now some people might call the ensuing movement a trot and some might call it a warm canter and first cousin to a gallop we seized the game in a wink to get past the spot the next crump was due to arrive on afore it did arrive we did too handsome and with some to spare though when i heard the roaring swoosh of it coming down i thought we was for it and a direct hit was due but it went well over and none of the splinters touched steady there steady shouts the lieutenant but keep going they'll repeat the series if they got any sense we could hear the blighters crumping away back down the road behind us and believe me we kept going all right but the boche didn't repeat the series he went on a new game and just before we came to the end of the straight stretch four crumps pitched down astride the road ahead of us about two hundred yards one hit the edge of the road and the others in the fields on both sides and one of these was a dud and didn't burst but we knew 
that the fellers that did go off would make a highly unhealthy circle around and the prospect of being there or thereabouts when the next bouquet landed wasn't none too alluring the lieutenant yells to come on and we came oh take it from me we came a humping there was some fancy driving past them crump holes in the road but we might have been at olympia the way them drivers shaved past at the canter we was just past the last spot the four landed when i heard the whistle of another bunch coming and me air near lifted me cap off them wagons of ours isn't built for any spade records but i fancy they covered more ground in the next few seconds than ever they'd done before but going our best there was no hope of clearing the blast of the explosions if they explosioned in the same target and we all made ourselves as small as we could on our horses backs and felt as we was as big as a barn all the time and the rush was getting louder and louder then thud 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 and crash three of em dropped blind and only the one exploded and it being in the ditch didn't do any harm beyond sending up a spout of water about a mile high three duds out of four if that wasn't a miracle i want to know but we wasn't counting too much on it being miracle die and we kept the wheels going round with the whistle overhead and the crashes behind to discourage any loitering to gather flowers by the way and when we was well past and slowed down again i heard the lieutenant draw a deep breath and say soft like a packet of chinese crackers but he said something stronger that same night he just crawled back to the column with his empty wagons leaving me as orderly at the battery and me having a pressing message to take back for more shells i trotted out and got back soon after he did i took my message to the old farm where the officers was billeted and the mess man takes my note in i got a glimpse of the lieutenant way his jacket and boots off and his breeches following suit i'd a rotten day he was saying but one good point about this am call job and the only one i can see is that you get the night in bed with your breeches off but if you'd only heard him when he found out he was for the road again at once and would spend his night in the rain and dark instead of in bed well i couldn't repeat his language not having the talent to his extent he was transferred to a battery soon after and i heard that when he got the orders all he had to say was thank heaven i'll maybe get shelled oftener in a battery but at least i'll have the satisfaction of shelling back and i may have a punk hole handy to duck in when it's extra hot instead of riding on the road and expecting it to go off like a packet of crackers maybe he was right concluded the bombardier reflectively but i suppose it's entirely a matter of taste and our man likes being killed off end of section thirteen